fucking hawkers gold medal gold medal and 100 meters is over right Welcome, welcome, welcome to a special live edition of the Friday 15. Let's run.com co-founder Robert Johnson joined by the hardest working man in track and field, ACE staff writer, Jonathan Galt. What a USA's meet. We may be joined by Weldon Johnson. I'm not sure, just audio only. He claimed he went out to dinner, John, with the wife, but pretty sure he's texting in saying, what an amazing meet. And in case you missed it, the biggest story of the night came last. Noah Lyles takes down Christian Coleman, 6.47 in the mid-60. 6.43. You're shortchanging him, Robert. PB for Noah Lyles, world leader. At altitude. Already the best in the world at the 200. Already the best in the world at 100. Now he's the best in the world at the 60. Of course, that's not looking good for my bold prediction that he would never win an Olympic gold medal, but I will point out that one of his biggest rivals, let's say Tobogo, did run a 300-meter world record today in South Africa. The Olympics are going to be amazing. I mean, you're going to have, if you get Knight and Tobogo, Coleman, Lyles, Curly all in top form, it's just going to be unreal. That's the sprint side of things. Distance race, races tonight at USA's Cole Hawker with a statement win. Hobbs Kessler, who he... Hawker destroyed the 1500 men's field, bossed the field around. Super impressive. Wins by 1.25 seconds. Kessler does make his first USA team in the women's 800. Eddie Wiley made her first US team as Allie Wilson got the win. Nia Aikens came up way short. What happened there? Women's 1500 very much went according to form. Hiltz and McKay won two. Men's 800 very much according to a form. Hopple and Harris one two we'll talk about all of that and more um we might talk a little bu john was at the bu meet yesterday who knows if we'll talk about the sad passing of the man can you guys see him over there there he is already forgotten his name john help me out you um, seriously robert henry rono r.i.p henry, henry rono r.i.p but amazing meet or fun meet you know to watch I shouldn't call it an amazing meet, right? I mean, let's be honest, you, you and I, but for the last hour, we're very entertained. Some events were not interesting at all, and that was because they were kind of shallow, but the events where you had legitimate star power in there, 
lived up to the hype. The men's 1500, that was exciting. Hobbs Kessler and Cole Hawker, I didn't know who was going to win. I will say I did pick Hawker on a podcast earlier this week, but I wasn't like overflowing with confidence, but he got a statement win. And then the men's 60, they did a good job on the broadcast. They were building this up. They were saying, these two guys, they're two of America's brightest stars. You've got Lyles dropping down. You've got Coleman, the arguably the greatest 60-meter runner of all time. He's the 2018 World Indoor Champion. He's the world record holder. This was the showdown. They were building a whole meet around, and it delivered. I mean, as, as much as a six-second race can be full of drama, this was. This was awesome. Uh, so glad that both of these guys showed up, ran the meet. Lyles gets the win, 100th of a second. 644, sorry, 643 to 644. And guess what? We get to see him do it all again in a few weeks in Glasgow with a world title on the line. So this isn't over. And you could tell Lyles was pumped. He knows how big of a deal this is to beat Christian Coleman in his specialty. Coleman was not happy. And of course, he's not going to be happy. He just got beat. He's supposed to own this event. He's probably thinking, how am I supposed to beat this guy in the 100 if I can't even beat him in the 60? So fantastic race. And I got to say, like, watching Coleman at Milrose last week and watching him in the prelims today, his start was not, by Coleman standards, very good. I think he actually got a good, pretty good start in the final. You know, he had a clear lead midway through. But Lyle's top speed, he's just getting to that top speed faster and faster. And in previous years, he would get to it, you know, maybe even, be, you know, in 100, he would get to it well past 60 meters. And... The reason he's so good at the 200 is because once he gets there, he can hold it. 60 was generally, for a long time, too short for him to get to that top speed. Now he's getting getting there or getting close to it, and he's winning big races. So really encouraging for Lyles. I don't, I don't think this was like a bad race by Coleman. He's obviously not in the peak form he was in 2018, but he got beat by a guy who just ran 643. 643 is a good time in the 60. Yeah, I mean, I will remind people that two years ago at World Indoors, we had the Olympic champion show up, Marcel Jacobs, 100-meter champion show up. We had Coleman show up. Marcel beat Coleman in that race, but didn't even medal at Worlds that year because he was injured. So, you know, I'm not saying that that, that uh, Lyles is going to be injured, but we you don't want to catch the chickens before, before they hatch, but he, he's looking – Super good right now. But, you know, I, I, I did ask John Kellogg, you know, I was like, I, I I never thought that Noel Lyles wasn't good. I just thought that these young phenoms would be better than him. You know, when he missed in 2021, I'm like, these up-and-comers are going to be, you know, going to be really good. And Tobogo, in case you missed it in South Africa. Now, John, was this meet at altitude? 30.69, beating Wade Van Niekerk's previous best by .02. And... I'm not really great at 300s, but John Kellogg seems impressed by that time. Obviously, it is the world's best, but it's kind of weird because, like, three years ago, I, I think the, the question was, okay, Lyles is amazing at the 200. He'll probably never win a 100-meter a, 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 a goal. Now with his 60, he's looking so good at the 100. Is it possible that he wins the 100 gold but loses the 200 to Debogo? Because remember – We've never seen this before. What we saw last year, I think it was right before Worlds. London a, Diamond the, League, yeah. One of the Di London Diamond League, Tobogo was closing faster under 200 than Lyles. He was making up ground. And you don't see that. But now with Lyles, like in the 60, like I, I called this race at 45 meters. I'm like, nope, Coleman's not far enough ahead. Lyles looks amazing. His close is amazing. So it's exciting. I hope everybody stays healthy. I want Jacobs back in the mix. I want a Curly in the mix. Sprint, let's sprint.com launching soon. Let's sprint.com. All right. We're primarily a distance site. I was going to say, let's move to this, but uh, there's a, a note here in the comments. We're live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter by bad clam saying, what about the men's pole vault final where a ref's mistake handed a win and meet record to Chris Nielsen? I, I don't know what they're talking about. How can a ref's mistake hand someone a meet record? Like, don't you still have to go over the bar to get the meet record? Bad clams, please explain what happened. John, have you seen this? I was at BU, BU yesterday. I really don't know what went on in the men's pole vault. But one more thing on Lyles before we move. I just want to say what the transformation he's undergone the last couple of years where he's now one of the best in the world in the 60 meters is pretty wild. You know, back 
at the start of 2022, his PB was 6.57, which is about what you would expect for a 200 meter specialist who's also pretty good at the 100. And then he goes 6.55 that year in 2022, PB, and he ends up running 19.31 for 200 indoors. So, like, all right. And then the next year, he goes even faster, 6.51. Turns out he's the 100 meter world champion. And now, you know, people are just doing simple math. They're following trends. Wait a minute. If he ran 6.55 and he ran 19.31, and then he ran nine, sorry, 6.51 last year and runs 9.83 and wins worlds, what can he do now that he's a 6.43 guy? And I know you said, Robert, yeah, it's indoors and, you know, flashback to Belgrade. Jacobs and Coleman go 1 2 in that race. Neither of them medal at the world championships, but that was part of that was Jacobs got hurt. He wasn't 100% healthy at worlds. I think for Lyles, I'm not like, freaking out like oh is he going to be able to sustain it he sustained it very well the last two years like he had he used good indoor seasons in 22 and 23 to propel himself to outdoor success those years so my my only concern really with him is can he stay healthy and usually he has been able to because i i think we may not have even seen the best of noah lyle's outdoors i want to get ahead of myself but the trend is hard to ignore when you look at how he's improved in the 60 and then improved in his other events the following seasons. But if I'm going to play devil's advocate, and obviously I need to, if um, for him not to want to go medal, I, 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 it didn't appear to me that the, 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 the success at the 100 translated to anything in the 200. So he may be having to give up something in the 200 specialty to achieve this success in the 100. All right, enough sprint talk. Let's talk to the men's 1500. This was the other marquee event for Let's Run fans, I believe, because we're primarily a distance site. And, you know, in, in case you missed it, we just, we're just we putting the results up on the page. It might be too small to see. But, I mean, this was just domination by, by, Hobbs, by Cole Hawker. He had the lead basically from 800 meters on end, right before 900, I think, he took the lead. And, you know, they were 145 at 700. So his final final 800 was 152.04. Just crushed the field. Wins by 1.25 seconds, 337.51. And this one was over early. I mean, I, I think with 200 to go, you're like, God, this guy's got it. This is super, super impressive. So big win, big win for Hawker because, you know, th this is one of the few races that I was really excited about distance-wise where we had – Everyone in the field had the standard. And, you know, I was like, someone's in this race is going to be upset. You know, the, 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 you know, you've got Kessler trying to make his first team. You've got Cooper Tier in there, Henry Wynn, Prakel, Ingles, etc. But Kessler ends up second by 0.505 of a second over Henry Wynn. Kessler looked like he started to let up right before the line. He could sense win and he did lean, but it, you know, I was like, wow, man, run through the damn line. But you know, I, I w one of the um, Rose runner live on YouTube says Hobbs was focused. Great comment here. Hobbs was focused on Hawker from the gun. Hawker was focused on the W statement win from Hawker. I, I agree. Like w w we're seeing the young stuff from, Kessler, what, has he turned 21 yet? He's still 20. I think he turns 21 next month, right, John? Yeah. From the 20-year-old. And we're, people are kind of anointing him, obviously, as the next great thing besides Nagus. But uh, is that premature? Like, he's really good. But we got to remember what Cole Hawker did in 2021 at the Olympics. How old was he then? 20. Same age so, as Hobbs Kessler is now. He was actually younger than Hobbs Kessler is now because he had just turned 20 and Kessler's about to turn 21. And he was what, seventh in the Olympics? Sixth? Sixth. And I mean, I don't know if Hobbs Kessler, he could easily get a medal. He could be a Nick Willis and a multi time medalist. He also could be someone that never, never, never finishes sixth on the global final. But he's clearly, Hawker was better than than Kessler at this age, both in terms of time and, and world finish. So we, we can't just assume that it, the U.S. 1500 meters, you know, in the years to come is definitely, you know, going to be Nagus then Kessler because Hawker says, don't forget about me today. All right. Let, let me pump the brakes here. First of all, it was a great run by Cole Hawker, and I want to get into that. But 
Hobbs Kessler, no, these talents, okay, we, we are blessed that we actually do have three amazing talents in the 1500 right now in the United States between Hawker, Kessler, and Nagoose. This was not a good race for Hobbs Kessler. He still made the team. So making the team on New Bad Day, that's some, that's a learning experience. He's run 348 at the age of 20. Like that is, that's what? That's a 331, 1500. That's about what Cole Hawker ran when he was 20. So he's got massive potential. That's sort of, th that's the biggest thing. What he still needs to improve on is racing. And that's okay. That's usually what most kids who go through the NCAA system are doing at this age. And he was so good that he turned pro when he was coming out of high school, made financial sense, and he's coming along fitness. But this is why you run the U.S. Indoor Championships. It's why you, why you run World Indoors. It's so you can get experience. Like, oh, I made some mistakes. So how do I run in the middle of a pack if it's not just a Diamond League-style rabbit race? This is the sort of thing where he's getting this valuable experience. So when he goes to Glasgow, he'll be a little bit more prepared. And then when he goes to Paris, if he goes to Paris, he'll be a little bit more prepared for that. So I think it's great that he ran this race. He was kind of all over the place here. You know, he was moving out on the outside. And I know it's it's impossible a lot of the times to run the whole race, like the absolute minimum distance. It's not always impossible. Cole Hawker basically did that, but it's hard. You know, some people in a 1500 inevitably are going to have to run a little extra distance. But Kessler, it looked like when he was moving up, he wasn't making definitive moves. He was running a lot of the tons in lane two or three. And I was just, I could kind of tell like, this ain't it, bro. You know, you, you, you're wasting too much energy here. Whereas Cole Hawker, so, so impressive. This was a tactical masterclass. I, I want to call this move the one he made it with three laps to go. We should just call that the Centro, where you kind of just make the inside pass. Um, and I thought it was good. Totally clean move. You know, he got right through Renewicki, but Cole Hawker was content. He was just sitting on the rail, and then he saw that opening. And I don't know if he decided, hey, I was going to move with 600 to go. That was the plan. Or if he just did it because he saw, hey, here's a gap to get to the front. But this was a brilliant run. His splits, I mean, Robert, look at his last six laps. 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26. I mean, that is how you do it. It was so, so good. And I think the difference between these guys, Hawker, I mean, Hawker could be fitter right now, but the difference is Cole Hawker has been through NCAA rounds. He's been through US rounds. He's been through World Championship and Olympic rounds. Hobbs Kessler last year was the first time he made a U.S. final, obviously, because he didn't run in college. So I think part of it was that difference, but Cole Huck is damn fit right now. He ran 805 for two miles last week. He sure did. But uh, the thing that we're missing from Kessler, you talked about experience, and I, I don't believe uh, – I mean, I, I try to go by the science and the idea of, oh, someone's a winner, whatever. I'm like, if you're better than people, you're a winner, you're not. But in this instance, like – I've never seen Kessler win anything. Now, I know it's harder because he's competing as a pro, as a Excuse teenager. Me, world road mile champion, Hobbs Kessler. Well, fair enough. But I I've never seen that, like, sick kick destroy people, like, like win big big championship races. You know, I mean, I, but I, admittedly, Hawker you got to do it a lot in college. You know, and you see him just turn the gears on and win it. And Kessler reminds me of the more the way he races – of like Nick Willis, like no offense to Nick, big fan. I'm a big fan of Nick. I love Nick Willis. He posts on the message board, but how many races was Nick Willis ever in to win it? Like not very many. This guy never won a one maker mile. Now he did win two Olympic medals, but he was normally kicking from eighth to third. And that's what kind of, I mean, Kessler was like, you know, kicking for second here, but you know, I, I'm not saying we're not going to see that, but it does. I, I I just, it reminded me today of like Hawker's got, you know, the smell of victory, which I hate that term, but he does have it. Like the guy just at the U S level is really hard to beat. So except well, and I think when, he's going to be hard no. to beat at the world level. Like we don't know Josh. Kerr, wait a minute. It's Saturday. We were told Josh Kerr was going to be making this decision this week. So I would hope to know whether he's running the, world indoors if i was him i'd do the 3k you know with how he, he just set that world record in the mile in the two mile like it'd be great to have him in that 3k and uh at world indoors and he only has to run one round instead of two but cole hawker we don't have ingebrigtsen there might not be car there's no whiteman cole hawker can go to glasgow and win the whole damn thing dude's fit 
dude has run good tactical races. This was a great tactical race. Like he's absolutely a serious gold medal threat at the World Indoor Championships. You and Cole Raymond on YouTube both agree. Evan Bollinger on YouTube, some lack the killer instinct. I'm assuming then that's referring to Kester. No, I like I 100 percent ag agree with that. I think if you put in a ghost in this field, it like helps Kessler because then it's just more of a time trial and how many people can run, you know, 331. Like I, I didn't like where where Kessler was early on in the race, but I used to always tell my guys, like, shut off your brain for the first 700 of the 1500 put yourself in position by a thousand and he kind of made a move around 145 to go outside he ran some extra distance as you said but when you think you're better than everybody else in the field that's the smart 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 call so um but i, I would be interested in, in in sort of i would have loved to have seen yared Nagus in this field like i'm not convinced that in, in a race like this that he just destroys hawker like Oh, Hawker. not at all. I, he, I mean, Nagus could win, but I think Cole Hawk is really, really good. Like, Cole Hawk might have been able to beat Nagus if they were in the same race today. Right. I mean, you know, like, we, we, we had it, was it 2021? We were all into the NCAs, who was going to win? And it was no contest, Hawker. And then we went to USAs, who was going to win? Hawker or Centro? And it was, it was Hawker. So it's just great to, you know, I, I think we were sort of, Hawker had been forgotten about a little bit. And to see him winning puts him back in, um, you know, contention. So let's talk about some other people in this race. You know, Henry Wynn, nothing to be ashamed of, 338.81 for third. Cooper Tier, 338.99. Like, again, uh, again, nothing to be ashamed of. He's the U.S., you know, 10K champion. He said he's been doing nothing. He gave, told you, Johnny, he's been doing no speed work. But the problem I have here is, I think he's going to end up being the 2024 version of Craig Ingalls, a very good runner, but not on an Olympic team. So I, I see when I see these results, it kind of reminds me why, you know, people think that Jerry Schumacher was trying to move him towards the 5,000. Uh, God, I know he's won a U.S. title at 1,500. I, I but think, think who wasn't in that race. Thing. He won. I, I don't want to like, He's a good 1500 runner, but Cole Hawker was not in that race when Cooper Tier won two years ago. Yard News was, but he, you know, he was still coming back into fitness. He wasn't 100% healthy. And Kessler wasn't in that race, you know, because he didn't make the final, but he wasn't what he was going to become. I just, I find it very hard to believe Cole Cooper Tier would be either Hawker or Nagus if they're healthy at the trials in the 1500. He might be able to get beat Kessler, but Kessler's ceiling's higher. But then, you know, if one of those guys gets hurt, then I think Kupatir is battling it out right for, you know, he'd be battling it out for that third spot probably. But then you've got Wascom and the college guys as well. I don't know. If, if his best shot of making the Olympic team probably is in the 5K. Chalimo has been declining a little bit. He might be moving up to the 10. So you'd still have to beat Abdi Noor, or, or not maybe necessarily beat, but you'd still be contending with Abdi Noor, Grant Fisher, Kincaid, Klecker, McGordy. They're good guys in there, but I, uh, Nick, yeah, uh, I, think, I think that's probably his best path to an Olympic team is the 5K, right? It's hard to say. Nico Young, you forgot about him. You also forgot about Harvard's Graham Blanks, who, by the way, John spotted him in a boot yesterday. Was Not a boot, crutches. Crutches, crutches. So if anyone knows what his injury is, like I heard it was an IT band about 10 days ago and things were, they thought things were okay. But if you're in crutches 10 days later, that's not good. But, you know, if you're a fan right now of, you know, Vincent Ciotti was, was up there, 339.03. I mean, these guys are only, you're only 0.27 seconds behind Kessler, but you're three spots. And then, but then it's another second back to Prakel. Sam Ellis, Craig Angles, way back, 344. And then you've got the, the University of Washington College kids. It's going to be tough. So I love it. You, you need to have winners and losers. Like my Baltimore Ravens should have been in the Super Bowl. They were one of the two best teams in football this year, but they didn't they didn't put it together when they needed to, and they didn't go. And that's what makes it amazing. So I, I this meet USA's could have been better. One of my takeaways would have been I wish that we had a dead period for world qualifying So during this week now, so that – 
I think Grant Fisher would have showed up if there was no other meet. And then you would have had him. It would have been great, even if he doesn't go to Worlds, to see who wins, Fisher or Nagus at 3,000. That would have been, you know, amazing. And I think you would have, might have probably had, if they gave the spots to the country and not to the time qualifiers, they, they should do allocation, the asset allocation, like they do in the marathon, for all events, so that you could have had, I mean, it's ridiculous that if we're going to send two, that Cooper Tier wasn't eligible to run the 3,000, or Cole Hawker oh, okay. wasn't eligible to yeah. run the 3,000. He ran the 805 two mile. He's clearly in shape. They should have two mile conversions, but it should go to the country, not to the individuals. And we should be sending any two that we want. If you hold a national championship race, you can go, go that way. But we don't want to, you know, bore everybody on that. All right. Women's 1500. Um, Nikki Hilt, I'm just going to say it at the beginning because I'm going to try to say they if I ever say it instead of she, is a biological female who identifies as non-binary. Therefore, she likes to, us to refer to her pronouns as they, them, or they, they, or whatever instead of she. Anyways, she, oh, shit, Hilt, you know, was really good and held off Emily McKay. McKay had McKay, a break McKay is how you say that name, just FYI. Yeah. McKay, former Binghamton University runner. Just 45 minutes from Cornell. Had a breakout year last year for Mark Coogan's New Balance team in Boston. Ran 359. And we expected those two to go 1-2, and they did go 1-2. Hiltz held her off. Makai was really – got close, and you're thinking the last 50, can she get there? Nope. Hiltz puts her finger up for one. And it was great to see the joy on Makai's face. Like, she was really happy to make her first, first U.S. team. So congrats to her. They were, you know, impressive um, there. So Hiltz, 408.35, McKay, 408.70. You know, that, that's a pretty good time at altitude, right? Yeah, especially because this thing didn't go out super fast. Like, I was going to say, can we get a JK conversion on 337.51 for Cole Hawker? Especially because that race didn't go out crazy fast. Like, I feel like doing that at 4,959 feet is pretty good. Um yeah, this 1500, this was one of these events. I just looked at the start line. I'm like, I know who's going to make the team here. It's a pretty shallow event. Only two people had the standard. Well, three, Addie Wiley, but she was doubling back from the 800. She wasn't going to be a factor here. Uh, Hiltz and Mackay were the two with the standard. They finished a second and a half up on everyone else. Mackay was, I mean, Mackay should take a lot of confidence from this because Nikki Hiltz has been, she was the, or Nikki, sorry, they, Nikki was the US champion in the 1500 indoors and outdoors last year. And Makai was right on them. Uh, Nikki got to the lead first, and that was one of the things that helped them win this race. The other was they did close marginally faster, 28.68 on the last lap to 28.78 for Makai. But Makai gave very little ground to Hiltz. It was just, you know, Hiltz was the one who, who took the lead and made that move. So good ra Hiltz takes care of business, three straight US titles between indoor and outdoor. And Makai, a, a very strong run for her. And now she gets to go to the World Indoor Championship. So I, but this was not a deep field. We did not have Sinclair Johnson. We didn't have Ellie St. Pierre. We didn't have Heather McLean, has been totally MIA this year. I don't know what's up with her. We didn't have Corey McGee. Um, just a lot of the key players for the Olympic trials were missing in this race. But two well, women, I do think both of these women are going to be key players at the trials. And I think it's important at the end of indoors to think about who didn't race. You know, I asked John the other day, where's uh, Ajay Wilson? She loves to race. Now, John reached out to her agent. She said she's healthy. She's just going a little low key. By the way, well, Rose Benner wants to know. to a coach, Derek Thompson. He essentially said, like, you know, she's kind of at a different stage in her career. She's getting older. She's, I think she turns 30 this year. And they've always done the indoor seasons. But at this point, you know, they it's not as important important for them they're going to try it i mean maybe it's he didn't say this specifically to sort of preserve her energy but it did seem like it's getting harder and harder for her to make those teams she didn't make the team last year so i think they really want to make sure they're locked in on the olympic trials rose Warner wants to know will we be going to glasgow to cover the meet i'm very thrilled to announce that yes i will be going i've got the permission from the wife my tickets are booked john's tickets are booked i'm not actually going to cover the meet folks i'm going to be john's wingman John thinks it's inappropriate, but John, we can have better luck on that side of the pond. Your home, the nation of your birth. Well, People it's uh, I don't know. Like I've never been to Scotland, but do the Scots like the English? There's there's been a very uh, there's been a rivalry between these two nations for quite some time, and 
I all the Scots I've met are great blokes, you know, or great uh, lasses in the case of Laura Muir. Like, you know, I, I've all the Scots I've covered, I think they're great. There, I know a few other people in the sport who are Scottish. I'm looking forward to going there, but I've, I've never been there. So uh, I don't know quite what it's going to be like, what the reception will be. You've never been there? Isn't it like a couple hours from London? Uh, yeah, it's probably like getting up to four or five hours from London maybe, but no, we, we never, we never visited when I lived there. But you have been to the South. Like Scotland is considered like the South of Britain, right? John, even though I know it's to the North, that's a nice comparison. Um, I think it would be, oh, it's actually, it's kind of hard to say. Like the, I would say the North of England is closer, like, to the south of the United States, but they're not rednecks as more of just being working class. We don't need to get into a whole demographics thing about United Kingdom and everything like that. Uh, but we're both going to be there. We're very excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited for some of these races because I think... Well, it's going to be extremely disappointing if Kerr doesn't show up. But regardless, we will have Hawker in the 1500, Nagus in the 3000. So I'm, I've got gold medal threats in both of those from an American standpoint. Lyles versus Coleman is going to be amazing and whoever else shows up you know i don't expect to see tobogo but that would be cool so it's going to be wonderful um but i just don't understand why kerr you know the emotional energy of having to run before your home crowd laura mirror will be there anyways all right so we've talked about men's 1500 we talked about women's 1500 i guess we haven't talked about the 800s men's 800 Totally according to four. Uh, like Hoppel wins, Harris second, everybody else a distance third. The unsponsored Alvarado put up a good fight. Um, some people on the forum were saying that they thought that Harris, I mean, that Hoppel ran like wasted a lot of energy, made a couple moves. I see that, but you're going to make a few more moves in the indoor eight than you are in the outdoor eight. Look, he still won the race. You know, 146 isn't like an amazing time, but he's a metal threat. He metal last time. Um, I thought that though, Robert. When I was watching it, I was like, he tried to get the lead a few times and just couldn't get around. And I guess we need to amend the old let's run adage. You only get one move in the 800. You only get the one one move in the 800 if you're like about the same ability as the other guys. If you're just way better than the rest of the field. I mean, he's not way better than Isaiah Harris, but if you're way better than the, everyone else in the field, you can make three or four moves and still be okay to get the win. So I think Hoppel has a couple things to clean up, but he got the job done. He's very consistent. He wins this. Do you know, Robert, do you know how many U.S. titles in a row Bryce Hoppel has won between indoors and outdoors? Five straight. He's won everything since 2022 indoors. He medaled at World Indoors last time. He'll be a threat again. I thought this was good. And then poor Isaiah Harris, he's kind of the inverse. This was the fourth time in his last five U.S. championships that he's finished in second place. So he makes another team. He made USA great. out. He made indoors last time. He made outdoors last time. He gets indoors, and this time he was a hero in Belgrade because remember he tore that. I think he tore his hamstring in the four by four, and he still gutted out that leg in the prelim. Uh, ended up kind of derailing. You know, it missed some time. You know, it didn't help his outdoor season. So. Now he gets to go back. He won it. He was a medal threat in 2022. He might be able to medal. It's the, anyone who makes the final in the indoor 800 has a shot to medal. I mean, Eric Swinski medaled in this thing in 2016. Drew Windles medaled. Isaiah Harris would be less likely. Sorry, Isaiah Harris medaling is less unlikely than those two guys. So certainly got a shot, both Americans, if they make the final. Yeah, it was great to see Harris make it because he was very patriotic, giving up a big part of his season last time. For this, you know, I, I would like to. I, I'm pleased, just from a logical standpoint, about Hopple, because in recent years, at least outdoors, you know, hasn't been doing great. You know, 2019 when he's in college, he gets fourth in the world. 2021, semis of the Olympics. 2022, heats of the Olympics. I mean, of, of the of the 800, and then last year he did make the final again, but he was a distant seventh. And I'm like. You know, if you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result, like that's not very smart. So what has he changed up? Well, he's still the same coach, but he's trying out to for the first time. And, you know, when you go on that spectrum of like how much of the 800 is like aerobic, anaerobic, it's like just over 50%. Some people say aerobic. 
So it can help you a little bit. I just think doing something different gives you hope also mentally that you can make that breakthrough. Disappointing here to me not to see Brandon Miller, who's now with the Brooks Beast. Here's his teammate. He ran a quick 600, third fastest performer ever, or second fastest performer ever now in the 600. Last week did not start yesterday. I was like, I, I didn't watch yesterday. I like, turn on the final, I'm like, where's Harris? Where's Harris? And I have to go back and see a DNS from yesterday. But Yeah, his coach, Danny Mackey, I asked him, why didn't he run? And he said he had a hamstring issue. Sounded like a fairly minor injury. He said the, if the race was two days later, he would have run. But it's an Olympic year. They don't want to take any risks. So that's why he was a DNS. Now, Thomas Lester says a should be the clear favorite in the 800. I assume he means outdoors because a not running the indoor championships. And do you agree with that assessment, John? It's like, Arup it's and Wanyonyi. They're they're pretty much one A one B. They were right with each other in a bunch of races the last couple of years. I think Wanyonyi, being younger, probably has a little higher ceiling. But look, that that one K he ran in Boston, Arup two fourteen, super impressive. But to me, they he's essentially co favorite with Wanyonyi. And when Wanyonyi beat him in the two races after Worlds last year, so I think they're very close. But I don't think he's a clear favorite. Yeah, to me, I mean, they were so close in so many races. When Yoni was the world leader, it was nice to see two guys run the 142s again. But when Yoni's just 19, but a Rob isn't, God, he's just, he seems to be getting better. It's, it's, that's what's going to be amazing. It's going to be a good two, race. It's good that yeah, we've got two stars in the 800 now after a couple of years in the wilderness. We got, you know, this is going to be good. Yeah. So that should be fun. All right. That was the men's eight. Women's 800. This is interesting. It was. I, I expected this to be a dominant performance by Nia Aikens. She won indoors USA's last year, won USA outdoors this year, had not run the 800, but I think had run a mile PB and a quick 600 last week. So I'm like, she's going to crush these girls. Who's getting second? And the gun goes off. She's like in the middle of the pack. And then like, you know, on the third lap, I'm like, okay, you want to put yourself in position. And said she's like, enters the bell like halfway around the first turn on the bell lap she's in the last place i'm like this is leaving it too late and it was she she doesn't make the team now she did close okay i guess i mean she finished third in two flat 90 but Allie wilson who used to be of the atlanta track club wins it in two, two flat 63 over addie wiley two flat 70 so wiley makes her first team Wilson, interesting story. You know, they fire the Begley's, Amy and uh, Andrew. Andrew Begley is the coach of the Atlanta Track Club. And she quit the track club to stay with them. She's now unsponsored as a result and wins the U.S. title. So she was thrilled, crying about it in the post race interview. That was cool. Wiley makes her first team. <laughs> Extremely disappointing for me for Aikens, but I'm giving her a pass, John. First of all, does she normally come from behind? Yeah, a little bit. But, well, I, I do think you like to have at least 1-800 in your belt if you're drinking. But I, I, she, yesterday, she lost her shoe early in the race and ran it with one shoe, you know, in her bare feet, basically, or she had a sock on. So I don't know how much that impacted her foot. So it could have injured her foot, and her foot's not well. And you're putting a lot of force in your leg. So I'm totally get out of jail card for me today extremely disappointing if, if she didn't have that problem i've been like this is terrible like how does she run this dumb of a race and become that far back to finish third like but you know was she too confident but uh, for me given the fact that she ran what how many laps yesterday with one foot one shoe on the last two laps yeah well okay if the foot was an issue fine that's a fair excuse but Rob, I was watching this race. I almost wanted to yell at my television. I'm like, can someone wake up Nia Aikens and tell her this is a U.S. final? Like, it, this is, it was, she was treating it like some rust buster. And I'm like, you need to get in position. This is an 800 meter race. You know, it is hard. And she was fifth on the final turn. It wasn't then until she, then she starts picking it up and suddenly she passes two people. She almost gets there. If this was like an 810 meter race, she might have won it. But I was like, she should be on this team. You know, I think she's just better at the 800 than both of these women. And she ran a tactically horrific race today. So 
that was one of my takeaways. The other one, Allie Wilson betting on herself. I mean, that's cool. And she, she'd had some near misses at USA's as well. Last year indoors, she was second. She was fourth in 2022, first person off the world's team, sixth at the trials in 2021. But she won last week at Milrose. Um, she wins again today. Might I mean, is winning indoor 800 enough to pick up a sponsor? Maybe. I mean, she might get something ahead of the trials. But, that, but that's kind look, of- if you're a U.S., it's going to be hard to get a sponsor, right? Because you've got all thing Mo expecting to dominate the event. And then, like a number of other men. Yeah, Raven are- Rogers. No, there there are a lot of people who I expect to to beat Ali Wilson at the U.S. Outdoor Championships. That's why I think I'm kind of amazed that she gave up that situation because, um, you know, it's not going to be easy to get a new sponsor. But I commend. Uh, you know, you could tell how much it meant to her to make this team to win a U.S. title. This was the breakthrough that she was looking for. So, congrats for her to running a, a, a tough race. And then Addie Wiley. 20 years old. She's going to the World Indoor Championships. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what she decides between the 1500 and the 800 because the 800 globally, you've got it's a tougher event from the US between Rogers, Akins, and a thing Mo. And the 1500 is a little weaker, but you know, is, is, she still has to figure out, you know, is she an 850? Which event is her better event? Or does she just try to double up at the trial? She might just end up doing that. But this was she. She is on her first team. She gets to go to World Indoors to make a team in the in this event in the U.S. at the age of twenty is pretty impressive. Don't tell that to uh, Ricky Slicks on YouTube. He calls her dime a dozen. Ricky, are, are you drinking tonight? Are you on some sort of narcotic? She's not a dime a dozen. She's run what one fifty eight and three. One fifty seven and three fifty nine as a teenager. No, that's she's one of the that's not a best US talents in the ever. US. Now, I think if you're looking at it globally, she's got no shot of well, I shouldn't say no shot, but it's harder to medal in the fifteen hundred for for an American. Yes. Like you've got all those Ethiopians, you got Faith Kipia gone. Now, you know, could could in Laura Muir. So the if you make the eight hundred, I don't know, still not easy. I think she just, I mean, she's used to doubling. She would like triple up or quadruple up at some of these NAIA meets. I assume the trials, I haven't looked at the schedule that came out this week. I assume it's like it is usually. You have the 800 for the first four days and the 1500 the second four days or vice versa. It is pretty manageable to try to run both events. And we've seen women fail in one and then come back and make the other, like uh, Brenda Martinez in 2016. So I would guess that's what she ends up doing. I mean, I was shocked. She she started the fifteen hundred like fifteen minutes after the hundred final. So I don't think a double at the trials is going to face her, even though she's only twenty years old. If you're just joining us, this is a live edition of our. Normally, it's our Friday as a bonus podcast. Today it's Saturday. If you're a Let's Run Not Come Supporters Club member, you get this podcast in your podcast feed every week. Otherwise, you don't normally get to hear it at all. But today we're doing it live, so you can watch it on YouTube. Someone said don't delete it, so I won't delete it off YouTube. A lot of times, right when it ends, I just go off and delete it. But today I'll be nice. because We're not going to write recaps. We're just going to put this up as a recap because i got to get home. As long as Robert but, doesn't say something stupid in the next 10 minutes that we'll, we need to expunge from the internet, this will be on YouTube. People say It, me. it could be me. I mean, the, money's, I the smart money will be on Rojo, but I could say put my phone in my mouth. Who knows? Yeah, I, I did. I did filter myself on Tuesday's show. We deleted some comments. I had. I, I think we should leave the other stuff. You know, more, more thoughts on Kipton's death, Henry Rona's death, till the regular show. Um, you were at BU yesterday, John. You know, big news. Grant Fisher just misses the American record. I was more impressed by this than I was Kincaid's American record because he ran the final three thousand all alone. I mean, in Kincaid's American record, he had a rabbit basically for like 4,900 meters and by the name of Joe Klecker. So super impressive run. Only two seconds from the world record. I'm like, why don't they just set that up and go for the world record? But I guess you said he didn't seem upset that he, he wasn't really that upset that he didn't get the American record. Well, or- he wasn't. I asked him like, you're running like basically world record pace. He was two seconds off the world record. Do you go into this thinking this is a world record attempt? He's like, I really wasn't trying to think of it that way. Like, I didn't want to put that sort of pressure on myself. And 
He's like, I just think I'm ready to run 62s. And if you run 62s and kick, it's a world record. But he's like, I wasn't approaching it that way. I just wanted to get a hard effort in. So I think certainly could have gotten an American record if he had a little pace, you know, pacing going beyond 2K. But it's also hard to find paces for that long. Like what Kincaid, like you said, Robert, he had Klecker going for a fast time, helping dragging him along. So what the really what really would have benefited him is if he had someone you know, another athlete to race and maybe push him to a fast time. But he's pleased with where he's at. And he also, Grant did not use the cliche that he hasn't done speed work yet, but it does sound like he's in a very strength oriented block. Like his, a lot, he's been doing a, little, doing a lot of reps between 60 and 64 seconds, but it's geared up towards getting strong and getting ready to run sub 27 at the 10 next month in California. So I think, Grant Fisher, there's a six-day indoor season. It was very brief, but I think he can come away knowing he's very, very fit at the moment. This has got to be a confidence booster to run 803 and 1251 in the span of six days. Um, he's in a very good spot. It's great, and I think it shows you that you're sort of – to me, this was a little bit better than his race last week. Like your second race, you can make a step, big jump, you know, in one week because you get the rush buster out there. But – There was somebody else at BU, and I'm I'm not gonna lie. I have not watched the YouTube video. You spoke to him, one of Weldon's favorite runners. Come on, Evan! Come on, Evan! Guy that almost broke eight minutes in the steeplechase, but apparently it looks like he'll never break eight minutes in the steeplechase. Evan Jager, and I saw your YouTube interview with him, and I couldn't even click on it because I had the same reaction that someone else in the message board has. This is down on page three now. It says, "Did Evan Jager turn fifty years old?" He looks old. I know that I'm old. You know, I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'm older than 39. And I thought, shit, that guy looks like me, man. So, John, is he upbeat? Is there any hope? Oh, no, he's upbeat. Uh, Robert, I mean, I didn't have the reaction, oh, he looks 50, but it would have been the first time I'd seen Evan. And it, I kind of felt that way, too. I'm like, oh, he looks kind of old, you know? Um, and he turns 35 next month. He's This is his 16th year is a professional track and field athlete. Remember, he turned pro after his freshman year at Wisconsin. So he's been around for a while, and he's still getting after it, and he's he's feeling pretty good about where things are at. He was talking about talking to Jerry Schumacher going into this race. Like, he kind of wanted to run the whole... Well, first, he wasn't sure if he was going to run, but then he runs, and he's like, well, should I just finish? But no, they're like, look, just run to 4K. You know, you, you don't need to... We don't need to be stressing out. His whole thing is, like, staying healthy. And obviously that's going to be the priority. He's run one U S final since 2018, but in that one U S final, he made the team in 2022. So if he can just get to June healthy and in pretty good shape, he's still a threat to make this team. This is the greatest U S steepler this country has ever produced. And it's not close. So he was saying workouts have been going pretty well. He trained away from the team. He was in Portland in the fall and he was just like, look, if I get in this group, I'm going to be trying to hang with them. And that's not good for me. I need to go at my own pace. But he also said, you know, once it comes time to start logging series training, he needs a group to be able to push him. And, you know, he, he doesn't want to train on his own because I asked him, did you ever think about leaving Bauman when all these other athletes did? And he said, I, I think I, I need training partners to help me out. And also he has a very close relationship with Jerry Schumacher. I think he's, you know, one of the best coaches in the world. So yeah, he, he's he's in a pretty good head spot, but his thing is like, look, I, I know I have to stay healthy and I'm doing everything I can. I'm trying to be cautious. And that's one of the reasons like, you know, he's like, when I'm at my age running a hard indoor race on these banks, like it, it takes a toll on you. So that's why I didn't want to go to the well on this thing. Yeah, I liked hearing that because, again, it reminds me a little bit of, of Hopple. Like do something a little bit different. Be smart. Just don't do the same thing that you've always done. His loyalty to Jerry is admirable. I, I, I admire loyalty. All right. Let's get out of here soon. Someone said we should talk about the three Ks from Friday night at USA's. And, you know, I agree. First of all, I love Nagus. He did the flex, crosses the line, flexes this. That's a new kind of new side of Yara Nagus. He's not a guy I thought would be flexing across the line. I was like, ooh, is this like, you know, a new level of yard? I, I, I was, or maybe it's just you start winning U.S. titles, you need to come up with new celebrations. So the first one, he wins outdoors, and now it's like, all right, so, flex. Yeah. 26 won last 200, 755, 76. Dominant win. All in Hacker, second, about a half second back. 
756-22 over Beetlescum, et cetera. Abdi Noor was up there pushing the pace for a lot of it, only 758-65. Now that's a PB, it says, for him. Probably not counting oversize. Look, if, this was good for Nagus. If anything, I thought people were closer to them than I thought they would be, but it doesn't matter. He won the race. Can't, I'm excited. I'm, I'm going to fly to Scotland to see the dude. So thrilled for, thrilled for that. Good for Hawker as well. Very disappointing to me for Nur. Like, I think of Nur as a guy that could, like, medal at Worlds Outdoors, Olympics Outdoors. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter where he is, you know, February 17th, but I was expecting more when he was up there. I was like, oh, wow, this guy's just going to boss this race, and he didn't do it. Um, by the way, John Kellogg says altitude for the 1500, he thinks, is three to four seconds for 1500, so probably be... Call it 333 eight. high, maybe? Yeah. Um... And no, women, I mean, was, the three Ks, I feel like there's just not that much to talk about. Nagus and St. Pierre were just on paper, clearly the best in the field. And St. Pierre totally dominated. I mean, it was ridiculous. We talk about walking in a race. They basically were walking uh, about a lap and a half in, like going around that turn. I was like, people are going to trip over each other or something. It's just did like, they actually walk? Can I get a video? It, it was like movie? they were moving at walking speed they now they i think if in a race walk they would have been dq'd because they were still running their feet were leaving the ground at the same time but they were basically you know when molly seidel did her video she tried to do like the slowest run ever like slowest mile ever it was basically like that they were moving their feet up and down but they weren't moving forward very much so but almost nine i mean we expect to be dominant but nine second win i just think saint pierre is doing unreal right now so congrats to her she is but like yeah. robert who in that field was going to stick with her like i guess josette and beating joseph and joseph andrews is a good runner so beating her by nine seconds is impressive i mean but, ellie hennis is a is got a faster pb uh, pb than yeah, ellie, ellie she's hennis like is, woman. she's not what she was last year she's still coming back do you hear this she had a lung surgery robert like no it seemed kind of wild yeah she's ellie hennis is her best like terrific runner but she's working her way back into shape, and she's not the Ellie Hennis of 2023 quite yet. All right, another action today. Alexis Holmes, the woman who walked down from Kabul in the mixed 4 by 4 last year, got a meet record 50.34. How about this in the men's 400? A white dude named Brian Fust. This is a guy who went to three different colleges. He's 25. He just finished college last year. He never made the finals of the NCAA. Never ran faster than 45 67 in college. He just runs 45 47 indoors to make the team. So, congrats to him. I mean, amazing. It's really amazing. And I got to feel bad for Matthew Bowling. Like, he went out super hard, had the lead to like the last 50, and then fades. And when he was still trying because I think he thought relay team, relay team, relay team, you can actually make a lot of money because they give world record bonuses. He got a world record in the mixed uh, four by four last year at World Outdoors. Yeah, made a ton of money on that. And he leaned to the line and faded all the way to fifth. So I'm afraid they're going to kick him off the relay team. Well, he'll be in, he'll be in the relay pool, right? But did they take uh, him to Yeah, they, they might just use 800 they pay I, don't, I don't know. Robert, is it like, am I just being making the most basic stupid pun here saying like, did Faust make a deal with the devil to get win this race? I don't know. It's like, I, I feel it's there for me, but I could be more creative. I saw that on that. Twitter or on the forum. I didn't know what that meant. Faustian bug. Oh, what does that mean? Like, Robert, I mean, you graduated from Princeton, right? They let you graduate from Princeton without even knowing about Faust. It's just, it's a, a ancient legend. It's been adapted in many other, you know, different, well, not ancient, but uh, I think Goethe was the most famous one. Essentially, the guy is offered a deal with the devil. So any sort of Faustian bargain, bargain a character named Faust is offered a deal with the devil. Uh, any sort of thing, Faustian deal with the devil, that's a Faustian bargain. See, I don't need to know that story because, first of all, I, I prefer nonfiction. And <laughs> okay. there's a guy by the name of Robert Johnson. Like, I'm not even, clearly I'm not the most famous Robert Johnson that's alive now. I mean, it's probably the Oregon coach or there's a couple Former of Oregon Johnsons. coach, yeah. The, the head of BET TV is Robert Johnson. But the guy that invented the blues, Robert Johnson, which is a true story, he sold his soul to the devil to learn how to, to get the truth. But that's the rumor. So it's the math there. Anyways. Anything else, John? No, I mean, well, the, the other thing, I, I don't know if we wanted to go back to be you, but I did think we had a comment here from Brandon DeMoe 
uh, from Brandon in the comments saying the other Bauman guys didn't run that well. I mean, I was just like, how wild is this to, to you, Robert, that we had Puma go two, three, four, and then you had Bauman's best three guys go five, six, seven. I mean, two years ago, if I told you Puma was going to have three, like there's a race where Bauman guys are going for the Olympic standard. They're going to send their best guys and Puma is going to have three guys in front of them. Like what, what sort of, could you imagine that in your head? Two years ago, I wouldn't have been able to imagine it, but it's it's kind of where we're at now. No, these Puma guys are they all part of Alistair Amy Craig's group, or are they just on their own? Patrick Dever is, Amon Kemboy is, Jack Rowe is not, but I think well, Jack Rowe has been so, training with them recently. What we have here is there was a guy named Nick Saban who was coaching, I think, at a school called Alabama, and then his coordinator Kirby Smart left and went to Georgia. And Colin Cowherd. Famously called him. Oh, he's just a coordinator. It's like, look at the Patriots. Their coordinators leave. They, they never do anything. How do you know he's a head coach material? Kirby Smart's done pretty well at Georgia. It looks like the Craigs are doing pretty well at Puma. They are. Ser no, seriously. Alistair Craig and Amy Craig coaching stock way up this year. Patrick, they got Pat Tiena to run a 207 marathon. Fiona O'Keefe wins the Olympic marathon trials in her debut. Now they've got Dever under the Olympic standard. Uh, I mean, Ken Boy's running really well. Yeah, th they've had uh, quite a good go of things recently. Plus, they're much, maybe we should start rooting for them. They're much more, you know, we can text them, much friendlier with the media. Uh, you were always obsessed, like, oh, we should just root for the people who talk to us. And it's not, it's, I don't root for anyone, and that's not a good way to go through the sport as a journalist. Anyway, all right. Okay, next on Tuesday show, I'll, I'll be announcing which pros have a silent boycott of Let's Run. There are a few. There's a sprinter, prominent sprinter. Prominent marathoner. We'll keep it quiet. Though. No, that that's, that's something a... that you might get at a supporters club meetup in person where we're talking about beers. We don't need to be publicizing and exacerbating any sort of beefs that may exist. It's one side of beef. I'm happy to talk to everyone. So anyway, that's going to do it. That's the USA 2024 Indoor Championships recap. Noah Lyles over Coleman. I mean... Oh, that was so good. I can't wait for the Glasgow. That's going to be so exciting, That the hype around that. The Brits are going to be into that. They're, they're going to be going, they're like, these are two Olympic 100-meter contenders squaring off in a 60. I don't know if Marcel Jacobs is going to show up or not. I'd love if he did. And then maybe we get Josh Kerr and the Goose in the 3K. Cole Hawker maybe winning, you know, among the favorites, the 1500. I'm already getting excited for that. So that's going to be a fun trip. Love talking track with you, Robert. Missed Weldon today, but he'll be back on Tuesday. We'll do another check-in uh, where Robert is feeling after this weekend's events. Noah, Ly it's, it's, Noah Lyles wins the U.S. title, but then Tobogo comes out with a world record. It's going to be interesting to see where Robert's head's at on Tuesday after a few days to have it sink in. So that's going to do it for our coverage. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We will be back with our regular podcast on Tuesday. Until then, so long.